So as we were sitting down to review this episode of Fast as Possible, I saw the folder name for the project and I asked John, what is a system on a chip? And he replied, I'm glad you asked. It's all in this script we're about to go over. So uh, here we go then. We are now in an era where a lot of us expect the smartphones we carry around in our pockets to do most of the things a PC can. I mean, the Samsung Galaxy even has a setting for multi-sample anti-aliasing so your mobile games will look nicer. But given that flagship phones are much smaller than even the most compact PCs, how have they grown from novelties that can't even copy-paste to do-it-all devices in only about 10 years? Well, much of the growth has been driven by advancements in systems on a chip, commonly called SOCs. Well, hold on a second, Linus. My phone isn't a system on a chip. It has a screen and buttons and a case with rhinestones on it. Well, when I say system, I'm talking about all the crucial innards that a phone or a tablet needs to function, like processors, memory, and storage and I.O. controllers. And if you've ever built or upgraded a desktop PC, what you'll know is that for the most part, these functions are all handled by different components that you have to either physically install separately or are installed separately on something like a motherboard. An SOC, by contrast, integrates multiple or even all of these functions into one piece of silicon that's the same size or even smaller than a conventional CPU. But how can all of this stuff fit onto just one chip? Well, remember that because phones and tablets are mobile devices that spend most of their lives running off of a battery, a lot of the components inside have to suck less power and produce less heat. I mean, a phone with a 10 minute battery life that feels like a hot stovetop wouldn't do you much good, would it? So this means that manufacturers have to save energy somehow, which usually translates to less powerful components with fewer transistors, which makes them physically smaller. But just because components on an SOC don't pack the punch of their desktop PC counterparts doesn't mean that they're bad. In fact, many mid-range and higher-end SOCs deliver very smooth performance, in part because their CPUs use the ARM architecture, which runs a smaller, simpler instruction set to make processing easier, though perhaps less versatile. And you can learn more about ARM CPUs in this video. And because mobile apps and operating systems like iOS and Android are written for these CPUs, that means that you're not waiting around three times longer for your phone to do something, even though your SOC might be several times less powerful than your desktop rig. And if you're an Apple fan, their SOCs take the concept of less is more even further, because unlike Android SOCs, which have to work with tons of different devices and brands, Apple's SOCs only need to work with their own hardware and their own software. So iOS has been further optimized to run well on Apple chips that are, at times, less impressive sounding than their Android equivalents on paper. For example, the new Apple A10 SoC inside the iPhone 7 is the first quad-core chip we've seen in an iDevice, when Androids have been available with eight-core chips for years now. And we're even seeing the same integration concept in desktops. It's not limited to SOCs, although PCs aren't packing everything from RAM to LTE communication logic onto the die, or even the package for that matter. And the trend towards this goes back decades even, with Intel being the first to move the cache, which used to be an external chip that you plugged in, onto the CPU, and AMD's more recent integration of the memory controller into the CPU die, which used to be a separate chip on the motherboard called the Northbridge. This might have seemed, at first glance, like they were just increasing the CPU's complexity 
for the sake of it, when we'd rather just have a bigger, more powerful CPU and keep all that stuff off board. But in reality, the reduction in cache and memory access latency from getting them closer together more than compensates for the wasted die space and additional cost. And this is even true of onboard graphics with better on-chip GPUs now being pushed as an all-in-one solution for light to moderate gaming, as we've seen with Intel's Iris Pro Graphics and AMD's APU series. Not quite the same as a full-fat graphics card, but who knows? With the way things are going, maybe one day we will have entire systems the size of a postage stamp or, you know, failing that, even just a modern CPU that can max out crisis. Speaking of postage stamps, ha! Thank you, Internet. We hardly ever need those anymore. And thanks to the growth of the Internet, there have never been more opportunities for the self-employed. And to meet this need, FreshBooks is excited to announce an all-new version of their cloud accounting software. It's been redesigned for the way that you work, and it's the simplest, easiest way to be more productive, more organized, and most importantly, to get paid faster. You can create and send professional looking invoices in less than 30 seconds. That's right, less than the time it takes to watch this integration. You can set up online payments with just a couple of clicks and get paid up to four days faster. Bye, snail mail. And you can see when your client has seen your invoice and put an end to the guessing games and the excuses. And FreshBooks is offering a 30 30-day unrestricted free trial to our viewers. So to claim it, all you got to do is go to freshbooks.com slash techquickie and enter techquickie in the how did you hear about us section. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like this video, do that. If you disliked it, you can do that. If you want to check out our other channels, you can do that. And if you want to comment with a video suggestion, go ahead and do that. And if you want to subscribe, then you can do that too. Do it.